uh, commemoration of Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, obviously remembering the uh, atrocities uh, of uh, the uh, the wartime uh, period and of course all the more recent uh, genocides in Rwanda, uh, Bosnia, Darfur. Um, so just wanted to thank everybody for joining our event, but also for the number of events that have taken place across Greater Manchester today, uh, which have marked Holocaust Memorial Day uh, digitally, but very, very poignantly as well. Second thing, obviously, I wanted to talk about at the beginning was the the very difficult milestone that we passed uh, yesterday with um, 100,000 uh, people uh, uh, and more sadly now having having passed on due to due to COVID in Greater Manchester. That number is um, almost uh, 6,000, so 5,800 and 80. And uh, it's the reason why I wanted to start with this today, because we've got to start with num with names, I should say, not the numbers. It's really important to just focus on this for a moment, because for us, of those 5,880 people, uh, they are all someone's mum, uh, someone's dad, someone's uh, nan, granddad, brother, sister, neighbour, work colleague. They are all people who contributed to life here in Greater Manchester in one way or another, uh, who built the place, uh, who lit up the place in one way or another. So, you know, we just need to, at this moment in this pandemic, just take a moment to think about that. And obviously to say to all of those families grieving, and I know yesterday will have been difficult because it will have brought back the pain for every single family that's been bereaved during this this terrible time that we've been been living through that we are thinking about you and here there is somewhere you can go um, if you want to create that <laughs> personal uh, memory and reminder of your of your loved ones so i hope you can see on the screen um the page that shows the greater manchester remembers uh website which we um are created with support from Manchester Cathedral and colleagues within our digital uh, community. And it does create a very personal space where people can remember their, their loved ones. And we just wanted to remind you of that, um, of that uh, facility uh, at gmremembers.org.uk and just to ask if you were able to, to, to point people towards it at this, this particular time, because it may provide some comfort uh, for, for people who are struggling. So let's move on, colleagues, uh, to the statistics, the numbers. I, I, we have to do this, of course, um, to make sure that um, you're fully up to date on, on where we are. And so the, the, the headline uh, position is that we've seen another improvement, a significant improvement. If you look uh, down our 10 boroughs, uh, some have recorded pretty sizable decreases in the last week. Um, look at Stockport, uh, you know, by, down by 100. Look at Oldham, which um, hasn't always been uh, the lowest, or very little uh, in the last year been the lowest borough in Greater Manchester, but is clearly on these on these uh, figures. Um, what, what uh, a couple of things to say to you about this uh, slide. Um, firstly, that the numbers are still high. If we compare these numbers to the challenges we had last year they are clearly at the high end of anything we experienced last year so the numbers are the numbers are still very high secondly that while national lockdown has clearly had an effect and you can see that in the numbers it isn't as decisive an effect as we've seen uh, previously in the first in the first lockdown so the feeling is that the numbers are coming down more slowly than than they have done in the past the third thing to note about these numbers is that they are now reflecting the effects of, of what we're not going to call the new strain because it isn't the new strain anymore. It is now the dominant strain. So these figures reflect the fact that the new strain is the dominant strain. Uh, in Tameside, the Director of Public Health gave a figure uh, a few days ago that 70% of cases there are linked to the new strain or now what we might call the dominant, the dominant strain. And that picture is, is pretty much um, uh, consistent across the rest um, the rest of, of Greater Manchester. So that's the, the picture on the headline cases, still below England average progress, but of course case numbers high and we would ask people to, to absolutely uh, focus on that as well as this slide, which shows there are signs of increases 
um, or signs of um, uh, high cases in all age groups. Um, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, particularly a, a small increase in some of the older the older age groups uh, at the moment. It's still the 16 to 29s and 30 to 44s that account for the, the majority, but obviously the, the, the figures here suggest that there is uh, infection across the age uh, range uh, across our 10 boroughs. So um, a slightly different picture to the one we presented to you in different in different weeks. If I might just move on to testing. The figure on the right hand bottom corner, 4,103, probably reflects the highest number of, of, of tests that we have done um, at, at any at any point. So, um, you know, that um, is because of the lateral flow testing that, that we now have in operation across large parts of Greater Manchester. And that's the reason why we haven't included the positivity rate, because the lateral flow figures do, um, uh, if you like, um, uh, make the positivity figure less meaningful than it than it might otherwise have, have been. We can provide that to people if they wish to see it, but uh, just in case you were wondering why that isn't why that isn't there. If we might move on, please. A slightly more worrying picture here, um, which is a, a, a trend that clearly has been developing throughout this month, which is a higher number of infections in uh, our care homes. Currently 2.6% of residents uh, showing uh, signs. More positively, 96% of our care homes have now been offered uh, the vaccine. So, you know, massive progress made uh, to, to vaccinate care home residents across, across GM. So, obviously, while we pay close attention to this figure, I think there is more positive news around the extent to which we have now vaccinated care home residents. If we might move on, thank you. Uh, now, this is a challenging slide, and I think you know we are at the moment of maximum pressure on the National Health Service according to the modelling that has been done at the GM at level. What you will see there on that top line in terms of number of admissions, that's a, a challenging statistic for last, uh, well, as of today, to, to pick up um, what we've had over the last week, 382 weekly admissions. That's a, a high number, obviously, a further 617 people acquiring or being diagnosed with COVID in the hospital setting. So they are big numbers. If we then look at how that is translating to pressure on beds, uh, 165 people in critical care, uh, a further 1,133 in hospital. Overall, I am informed that one in four uh, patients in Greater Manchester hospitals uh, is a, a COVID uh, patient. According to the modelling, we expect the peak of the pressure on the hospital system to arrive around this weekend. But as Sir Richard Lees has said before, we don't expect that that um, will, will quickly fall back down the other, the other side. We expect there will be a plateau of high demand uh, on our hospital system for, for the um, for the, for the uh, immediate future. So um, a very challenging picture in the NHS. Obviously, we've seen all of us, some of the, the media uh, portrayal of what is going on in hospitals up and down the country. Uh, you can't help but just be in awe of the staff. Uh, we feel for them at this moment in time, but they really are uh, experiencing intense uh, pressure. And the deputy mayor will come on to say why those who know who are not following the rules need need to be sat down in front of those TV reports uh, because you know it's a very very difficult place to be the NHS right now. If I might just move on to vaccination, uh, and I, I'm sure this might be a topic colleagues will want to pick up in in questions. Um, this is obviously really good progress. Um, uh, that is a a really good uh, place to be at this point in the um, in in the the initial challenge that the Prime Minister set. You might remember that the figure we have to hit by the middle of February is 560,000. That would be the number if we have vaccinated everybody. And of course, some people are choosing not to take the vaccine. So you can see that we are really getting uh, towards um, being able to, uh, to complete this. However, there have been reports in the last 24 hours that the supply of vaccine uh, into the Northwest and into Greater Manchester is potentially about to be reduced in the early weeks 
of February. So uh, we have, uh, I said this morning that uh, we would be asking further questions uh, about this uh, and seeking reassurance. Um, what we have been told is that we will receive enough vaccine to hit the uh, mid-February target. Now, if that is the case, then of course we, we, we are reassured uh, by that, uh, recognising that other areas where the progress isn't as great do need to obviously uh, catch up. But, you know, we are still, if, if I might say, just a, a little um, concerned uh, about that reduction, or certainly I am a little concerned about that uh, reduction, partly because we don't have the week to week transparency over the numbers of supplies that we will be be given. And that makes planning quite hard. But also, um, we are concerned about the lack of flexibility still within the system and the lack of ability to move uh, vaccine around to, to create that extra ability to meet, uh, uh, meet demand with the available supply uh, that we have. So we will continue to ask for uh, more information on that supply line, you know, the firmer reassurance that we can be given enough vaccine to hit the mid-February deadline, because these figures show to you that we can do it. Uh, we are really getting close to being able to do it. We're currently running at around 100,000 vaccinations a week, which on that rate would tell you that we, we are in a position to be able to, to reach the deadline. And I'm very proud of everybody for putting us in that uh, position. I would want to thank them all. But um, there are just these issues around the, the strength of the supply line, the transparency over it, and the ability to have that flexibility to move uh, vaccine around. So uh, I think I only have one more slide. And that is just to support the government and the NHS in, in bringing this message to your attention. I think we feel that it uh, hasn't landed quite yet as much as it needs to be. This is the 111 first service that the NHS has stood up. And it's a message to the public that there's a different way of accessing A&E if you use the 111 uh, phone line and the 111 first service. And that is essentially, it provides for bookable A&E. Um, and we would encourage people to, to, to think about that if uh, people are attending A&E for reasons other than, uh, that, than an emergency or uh, concerns about, uh, about COVID. Uh, so this is the, um, uh, the, the advice to the public to, to go to NHS 111 first, either by phone or online. We think it will make it much easier for, easier patients, for patients to get the right get treatment the right at a time that suits them. But also, if it's not A&E, the service will um, give people an appointments elsewhere in, in the system, potentially at a, a walk-in centre or, or another venue. So it's just to encourage people to use this, this service, which probably is a safer way of accessing the NHS at this particular moment in time and helps us manage demand. So with that, I will leave it there for now and I will hand over to our Deputy Mayor, Baroness Beverly Hughes. Bev. Thank you very much, Andy, and good afternoon, everybody. I'll just run through some of the uh, enforcement issues, other issues for the police and, and fire services very briefly before we get to your questions, if I may. And I just first of all, would want to associate myself with the remarks that the mayor made uh, about remembering today, particularly the Holocaust and, and all those people who died in other genocides as well, and the survivors who are thankfully still with us to to witness that um, but also passing on the baton uh, aren't they very soon uh, to those of us here uh, and i think we must we must take that forward with with honor so um ac police activity over the last seven days from from last monday um you know we've got 2.8 million people uh, roughly across greater manchester and i suppose if only a very tiny percentage of those are bent on large scale social activities or activities that contravene the regulations at the moment, then I suppose that's potential for an awful lot of those activities. But that, I'm afraid, is what we're seeing. This was um, a, a very uh, busy time. Demand continues to increase. Over that period, um, GMP have dealt with 1,427 COVID breaches, including 788 house parties, which continues to be um, the biggest source of contraventions and, and, and large 
gatherings. Um, they attended at least eight of those where upwards of 15 to 30 and, and more people were actually um, present. Over the last seven days, uh, 220 fixed penalty notices were issued, 180 over that last weekend, uh, Friday uh, to Sunday. And you know, I've got a whole litany of examples here of the kind of activities that they, they had to uh, attend and I can't possibly go through them all, but I, I will just touch base on some of some of the worst, I suppose. Uh, in Salford at the uh, AJ Bell Stadium, there was a car cruise uh, event that had to be dispersed. Uh, and in uh, undertaking that, uh, an officer um, was hit by a vehicle leaving leaving the area. Um, only my injuries, thankfully, but you know, not good. Uh, issued a £10,000 fine to a family, uh, which was following a wake of 35 people at their home. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because the police um, got some intelligence that this was going to happen. They visited uh, the family, they tried to work with them, uh, persuaded them why this wasn't a good idea, even formally writing to them to explain uh, why this wasn't a good idea and that it was a possible breach. Um, but they ignored that advice and went ahead. And so in those circumstances, the police felt they had no alternative whatsoever, um, but, but to give um, a, you know, the most severe punishment that, that we can at the moment. Um, in all 10 districts, there has been a lot of joint activity between the police and the local authorities to try, uh, try and ensure compliance across businesses, um, which actually generally is fairly fairly good actually it's much more the social activities that that are a problem um, we've had three students evicted from their campus accommodation at Salford University though uh, in breach of regulations and this has been circulated around to the other students uh, a lot of work um, on the transport system in various parts of the, the the network Wigan particularly encouraging compliance with with mask wearing uh, and so on also at um, places of um, high footfall and, and beauty spots as well uh, around around Rochdale uh, and, and other boroughs. In, in Stockport, joint visits continue as well with uh, police and local authority pandemic response uh, team to encourage compliance and local authority officers here are now wearing the body worn cameras uh, that the police wear. Uh, so they can capture evidence better when they are not in the company of police officers when they're going out on their own. So that's a, an innovation that 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 that, that we'll watch and uh, and evaluate uh, too. Um, on the fixed penalty notices, I just wanted to say that uh, one thing I'd mentioned before about the the courts. There has been another dedicated court on the 14th of, of January to process fixed penalty notices. Um, all those cases either pleaded guilty or were found guilty in their absence, apart from one where more information uh, was required. Um, that's probably going to increase the national system for collating information about fixed penalty notices is, is changing. And I think uh, very soon we'll be able to download uh, information from the National Criminal Records Office um, to, to monitor more closely than we can do at the moment. What, what's happening on the fixed penalty notices. I thought I'd mention uh, operations too, because this weekend the, oper the special operations, Operation Ocean, which is uh, around COVID compliance and Operation Harrington, which is around public order, uh, will be stood up again. Um, and we don't have any intelligence at the moment about any large scale events or protests, but no, no doubt they're, 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 you know, depressingly maybe some more house poverty. Um, I wanted to say something about GMP and its operational capacity at the moment. I, I mentioned I think last time I was here that the OCB, the call handling branch, uh, had uh, started to experience some significant impact really from people being sick themselves or having to self-isolate. That's still the case. We're still about 20% uh, down on people who work in there, uh, that has been, the impact of that's been mitigated by moving people, but you know, they have to be trained, it does have an impact. So obviously the, the priority is the 999 calls, um, the 101 calls, I'm still answering those obviously, but it's taking a bit longer uh, and the average speed of answers gone up a bit because of those staffing issues. But just to point people 
as well to the two other means by which uh, members of the public can contact uh, GMP. That's through single online home uh, or the, that you can get through to the GMP website. That, that's a very good, good facility. We talked about it last week uh, in relation to the announcements on the budget. And also there's a live chat facility. And again, that's very responsive and it, it's really helpful if people can move to those online uh, mechanisms. Just a quick update on the crime support line that we stood up for people affected by the HMIC uh, victim support assessment uh, report. There are um, there have been up to date 228 calls. It's, it is diminishing uh, the rate of calls. That's not all individual people um, because some of some have run twice. Um, but all those calls are being dealt with very expeditiously. And again, I'd like to just thank victim support because they've been absolutely invaluable uh, on this. And then finally, just just touching uh, on a couple of things in relation uh, to the fire service. You'll know that um, a week ago today um, we were threatened with Storm Christoph, and um, that created a big impact on the fire service, but also on the police and local authority staff. The fire service attended 121 calls and made 80, uh, well, attend, sorry, had 121 calls and attended 84 um, incidents uh, across. Greater Manchester uh, and also actually supported Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service overnight. Um, th there were significant threats uh, uh, here in South Manchester where I live. Um, 2,000 people uh, upwards of were contacted by fire staff and local authority staff advised to empty their basements and ground floor and so on uh, and, and evacuate. Not all did. Um, but hotel accommodation and so on was, was stood up for those that needed it if they couldn't go uh, to family. And police and fire staff and local authority staff worked here and in other places across Greater Manchester uh, through, the, through the night. In the end, um, I think using the high volume pump uh, here, um, the, the Mersey Basin didn't, um, it did top, it didn't flood anybody's houses. Um, so fortunately, uh, residents did not have uh, that awful experience of being of being flooded and I'd just like to thank everybody because they really pulled out the stops uh, staff of all those services to make sure that people were safe and, and prepared and looked after. And then just finally to mention the HMIC FRS report that was published last Friday. This was a report into every fire service and their response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, as well as the thematic report, uh, pulling all those themes that uh, she, uh, the inspector identified together. The report for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, uh, I think was really positive and I'd just really like to again commend all the staff, the firefighters and the non-operational staff. Um, the fire service was praised for being ready, willing and able um, to work with partners to assist and support uh, people in Greater Manchester. It said they reacted quickly to the changes they needed to make and communicated that well to staff. Uh, they deployed non-operational volunteers and uh, retired officers to support and deliver a whole deliver a whole range of things: PPE, uh, face mask fitting, uh, humanitarian aid for people, and obviously joined the local track and trace uh, scheme in September. And did all of that whilst carrying on business as usual and providing an effective response to fire and other emergencies across the region. So thanks to them. I think that's all for me now, Andy. Thank you. getting better when you don't have to have somebody else unmute you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Bev. Um, I just wanted to finish with one uh, further thing before handing over to Ross to take us through your questions, and that is just to send a message to the people in Greater Manchester who are still excluded from uh, the government's uh, public support schemes. There are tens of thousands of people in our city region, many of whom are people who employ people or work in our creative industries, you know, basically are uh, the heart and soul of the place. And yet they still find themselves in this most difficult of Januaries out in the cold. And it's wrong, straightforwardly wrong. It needs to be corrected. I've written to the Chancellor to say, you know, in the case of some, let's take the newly self-employed, there is no reason whatsoever now why they can't be brought in from the cold. The reason the government gave 
that they couldn't be helped was that they'd never submitted a tax return. Well, they're doing it and many have done it uh, and therefore the information is in. So the time for excuses is over here. They need to be helped because what we're going to see here, in fact, we already are seeing is a mental health crisis on top of a pandemic where three million of our fellow citizens, three million taxpayers have been abandoned. It isn't good enough. I don't think it's good enough for the government to say it'll be looked at in the budget in March because that is six weeks away and it's a time that people in this position simply haven't got. So uh, the message is a direct one. Chancellor, you need to act and you need to act now. It is morally unjustifiable to leave people in this uh, position in this most difficult of winters. You said you would do whatever it takes. You said you would leave nobody behind. So far, you haven't made good on those words and you need to. Ross, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to take uh, questions on vaccines uh, in the first instance. So take the question from Katie at That's Manchester first. Um, Andy, are you satisfied with the rollout of vaccine in Greater Manchester so far? And on schools reopening on the 8th of March, what is your reaction to this? So I'll, I'll leave you with that one and then we'll move on to uh, ones about the reported cut to vaccines next. Thanks, uh, thanks Ross and thanks Katie. Yes is the answer to your question. I think I indicated that. There's been a massive effort going on here. Um, I think as of this week, we've stood up all of our vaccination centres. So 78, the staff, have really pulled out all of the stops, got so many volunteers working in the system and you see the figures, you know, 310,000 uh, jabs delivered. Actually, it's more because some people have had two jabs. So, you know, this is a monumental effort uh, and I'm really satisfied actually with both their efforts and the support from um, the NHS nationally and, and the government. Um, Obviously, we'll come on to the issues that, that might disrupt us uh, coming forward. But uh, yes, is, is the answer to your is, is to your question. And it's down to the amazing efforts of our teams on the ground. On the school issue, I did say earlier this week myself that March felt right to me as the, the month that we should target for, for school reopening. So I kind of have an instant reaction to the government's announcement that it feels about right uh, to me. Uh, it gives some time for the right arrangements to be put in place. If there is to be a change to the vaccination prioritisation to include teachers and school support staff, it allows some time for that uh, to be to be done. Um, of course, we'd like to do it sooner, but I think given some of the complications, it's probably a prudent date to set and we do have the February half term uh becoming uh, uh clear on the horizon so I, I think on this one i would say katie that yes um i think this feels about right to me um but it will only be right if we do those um uh, things that need to be done around uh, making schools safe dealing with all of the testing issues the vaccination um and perhaps making it from the 8th of March so that judgments can still be made at a local level and that we trust head teachers working in uh, consultation with directors of public health and, and local local councils. So still, I think there needs to be an element of, of trust of people at the local level, which we haven't seen much of during this pandemic. Thanks, Andy. And um, could take two questions uh, on a similar topic. Uh, go to Adam Clark from Rotch Valley Radio first. Uh, Andy, what's your reaction to the reports from Health Service Journal that suggest vaccine supplies to be cut by a third in February? Have you had any communication uh, from government colleagues about this? And if so, what have they said? Um, he's uh, mentioned that Cumbrian MP Tim Farron has written to the Health Secretary, calling it utterly inexcusable and asking for him to reconsider. Uh, Maya from The Guardian, um, also on this topic, uh, it's been reported that the weekly supply of the vaccine to Greater Manchester and other areas in the north will be cut by a third next month. Can you confirm this and give any more information about it? Uh, when will this be reviewed and is this an example of levelling down? OK, uh, Adam, I'll come to your question uh, first. So my reaction when I saw the Health Service journey, Journal story um, and then the subsequent reports of it was one of concern. Uh, but it wasn't an overreaction, if I could put it that way. So it needed to be fully investigated and understood uh, and clarification was sought. What has come back from NHS England, I think, as I indicated at the beginning, 
is that we will be given enough supply to to meet the mid-February target. Now, that is a an encouraging statement. Uh, let me be clear about that. And it, it is the case, given the progress we've made, that we may not need supply at the level we've had it to hit the February target. So I just think it's important to be kind of straight about this rather than you know, creating a controversy where at the moment that there, there may not be one. But that said, I am, uh, let's say I've got my eye on it and I'm a little wary about it, given, you know, the the, the proximity now of mid-February and the, the, the fact that at least, uh, well, around 200,000 people still have to be vaccinated uh, in Greater Manchester. So it's a little touch and go. And it's a bit worrying at this point that obviously we're seeing we're seeing these changes uh, announced. So I, I take the reassurance from NHS England on face value. Um, I will hope they will they, they will uh, they will stick to that and be true to their word. If they are, then then that 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 is acceptable uh, to us. I think it's fair to say that some more rural areas such as Cumbria and you mentioned Tim Farron perhaps are in a different position and um, it's important that they are not left in a position obviously where they where they won't be able to hit their target. So I'm only speaking for Greater Manchester here rather than other Northwest uh, colleagues. Maya on your question obviously I've, I've, I've answered in in some ways the um, the, the sort of main uh, the, the main part uh, of it. I am uh, c concerned um, uh, and it would appear that there is substance in the in the report, um, but as I've said, our concern is mitigated by the the assurance that we've that we've had. I think the question, the second part of your question, is is one that is valid because obviously the, we've had higher levels of cases in the north of England all the way through this. There is higher levels of risk uh, in our community. So while I can understand uh, an approach from the government that uh, is seeking, you know, strict numerical uh, equality in terms of percentage of vaccine given in different parts of the country. It is the case that our poorest communities are most at risk from COVID-19, as we've seen throughout this pandemic. So therefore, there has to be a regard to getting the vaccine into some of the poorest parts of the country. And that might mean more progress should be made there to protect more lives than simply adopting a sort of strict geographical um, uh, equanimity sort of approach. So I hope that I hope that makes sense. Of course, we're concerned about it. But at this stage of the you know, the vaccination progress uh, program, I think needs to be as free from politics as we can we can make it. Questions will always have to be asked and people will have to speak up for their areas. Uh, concerns have been raised over the last 24 hours. But it, as we stand today, I'm reassured by what NHS England have said to us about sufficient supplies to meet the mid-February target and of course I will be seeking to hold them to that promise. Thanks Andy and um, this is a question addressed to Bev but Andy you may want to come in on it uh, after. It's Nigel Barlow about Manchester Astor asking uh, Bev how concerned are you about the research published this morning from the Prince's Trust and Educational Policy Institute about the sharp decline in the mental health of girls from the age of 14 and the role of social media in this given the latest announcement on school reopening is this only to get worse? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question, Nigel. Um, I, I completely share those concerns. Um, you know, as we've gone through this pandemic and had our regular uh, meetings of the COVID emergency committee, we have focused uh, as much as we we could on some of the likely consequences for children and young people of what's happened to them uh, during this period. Um, not only of not actually being in school, not being able to socialise with their friends, but I think the, the general level uh, of anxiety in society during this time is something that they will have picked up on as well. Um, as you say, this uh, report, I, I, I think is, um, I think it's really interesting and very important. Um, it talks about actually not just girls, but it does, as you say, particularly point out uh, the impact on girls particularly and it looks at various factors that seem to be associated with poorer uh, mental health and poorer uh, self-image. And one of those factors they identified was heavy use of social media, uh, along with being bullied and, and other kinds of uh, social problems like not getting on too well uh, with your parents. And clearly, um, 
not being in school is, is an added difficulty uh, here because children don't have access to the kinds of trusted adults, the teachers uh, and the teaching assistants in schools who might otherwise spot, spot these things. Uh, and sometimes it's hard for parents to, to see that. I think what it means is that we've got to be, I think we've got to give much, much more attention um, as a society to how we're going to make up some of um, these impacts to, to children and young people going forward, um, obviously educationally, but also uh, on these other aspects of their wider, wider well-being. Um, schools, I think, have got a, a really important role to play in that, and I'm sure many of them um, will be focusing on how they can support girls and boys as they go back into school to address some of those issues. Um, we here have our children's board and we're planning to what Greater Manchester authorities and agencies uh, across uh, our city region um, can plan to do to support all that activity. But you've raised a really important issue uh, and I'm, I am very concerned about it. Thanks, babe. Andy, do you want to come in on that one? It's OK, Ross. Well, um, a question from Michael Gaffney uh, to Andy. Um, Andy, could you update us on how the call for donations to the GM Tech Fund has been going? The PM promised a plan uh, to help children catch up when they do eventually return to lessons. What sort of help is going to be needed in Greater Manchester? It's going to be massive, uh, Michael. You know, the damage is, is profound. Um, and I don't think we've got a plan or anything like a credible plan to, to provide it just yet. So to answer the first part of your question, as of Friday, which was our digital uh, donation day, we had raised at the close of play £188,600 in cash or donations of kit, new or old. So that's an amazing uh, figure actually, and also includes data uh, connectivity packages as well. Uh, that's more than half of the phase two target we'd set for the uh, tech fund. Uh, and given that we only launched it two weeks ago, it's it's, it's a fantastic uh, return. This means that uh, about 630 kit and data and device and de uh, connectivity uh, bundles can be bought. Um, so you know that that makes a makes some uh, inroads. So we've already given out more more kits this year than we did we did last uh, last year. Um, I would just want to thank um, the Manchester Evening News, who were a really valuable partner in getting that message out there. And just to thank everybody in the business community and individuals who, who, who answered the call. However, we do have to say that despite all of this and um, the government support that's been provided, there are about 15 to 20,000 uh, young people in Greater Manchester who will not be online and not learning uh, today. And of course, the government scheme doesn't include over 16s and some colleges are telling us uh, in GM that they have about 900 or 1000 students with uh, the need uh, for, for support. And it does link to the, um, the, the 8th of March uh, date that's been given uh, today. So because obviously we're now looking at um, five weeks uh, out of school at least and that is really worrying, isn't it? If we're going to have 20,000 people in our city region, kids with no ability to learn for five weeks on top of everything else. So, you know, that they have to get their finger out and they have to get all young people online in Greater Manchester, but all over all over the country. And the, and the lack of urgency around this, I'm afraid, is just um, unacceptable. Um, and David Blunkett was on the radio this week uh, saying how, you know, the right will and the right you know, focus, this course, this can be done. This is a solvable uh, task. And yet yeah, it's depressing that we're having to fill the gaps uh, in, in the way that we in the way that we are. I just want to add a further thing about um, catch up and implications for, for children when they return to lessons. I am hearing that uh, off qual in their um, consideration of what they should do to provide assessment for GCSE and A-level students and BTEC students this year, are saying that the assessment should be made on where young people have reached, as opposed to where they would have got to had they fully been in school, i.e. their potential as opposed to where they're at. And this is an issue that we're going to come back to because if they stick to that approach, I think that will cause serious discrimination against young people in Greater Manchester. So I just want to put a marker down today that we are still watching that issue extremely closely. We spoke out 
fiercely in support of our young people last year with the A-level uh, fiasco, and we will do so again. There has to be fairness in this system, given how much school time, how much classroom time our young people have missed. Thanks, Andy. A question from Stephen Kingston at the Salford Star. Does anyone know how many vaccines have been binned uh, because they can't be transferred elsewhere or to uh, in inverted commas friends and family? Thanks, Stephen. I certainly have heard reports that we've had some uh, small quantities of vaccine uh, wasted, um, but I couldn't answer your question how much. I'd have to, to take that one away if that's OK and ask Ross or one of the team to give you um, an answer. I think it's a small percentage, you know, very small, I think. Uh, but it does point to um, the issue I was raising earlier about flexibility in use of vaccine. Because the rules are quite inflexible, I think it takes away the room for manoeuvre to sort of, you know, provide to friends, family, as you say, or other work colleagues if, if it's otherwise going to be otherwise going to be wasted. And uh, I, I do think this is an issue that um, uh, the government needs to uh, uh, relax on a little and provide that uh, ability for, for vaccine to be moved around or given to others if it's going to be wasted. So we will we will get the figures for you. I think it's a very low percentage, you know, or even less than a percentage. I don't know, but we will try and get that figure for you if, it, if we have access to it. Um, and I would want again to make the appeal for more flexibility in the use of the vaccine. Thanks, Andy. A question from Jen Williams at the MEN. Uh, Andy, do you agree with Sir Keir Starmer that teachers should be vaccinated at February half term, assuming the first priority groups have been done by then? And given the regional variation in the peak of hospital admissions, do you have any concerns that the national timetable for lockdown release may be dictated by the situation in London as opposed to here? I know that has been your criticism of the approach to the first lockdown. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Jen. I do agree uh, with, uh, with Keir that uh, we should now be uh, developing a plan to um, vaccinate uh, teachers and support staff uh, to prepare for that uh, early March reopening. And that makes sense to me. I, I think the government has taken a, a cautious path and actually announcing the date well in advance is a sensible thing to do to allow schools to, to plan in the way they've not been able to do. Uh, up until this point. But I, might I just say, though, that I think police officers need to be included in this consideration and supermarket staff. I think supermarket staff have really been exposed uh, during this uh, pandemic. We all rely on those people to stay in work. And it feels to me that it is only right that there is then a sort of quid pro quo that they are prioritised for protection uh, when it comes uh, to the vaccine. So, yes, um, I do uh, support what Keir is uh, saying today. Uh, and on the second part of your question, of course, I remain concerned about uh, decisions taken uh, more with London in mind than, than the situation in all parts of the country. Now, it so happens that this time our cases tend to be lower uh, than London and lower than the, uh, the national average, which wasn't the case uh, in, in the first uh, lockdown. Um, <clears throat> so we are in a different, uh, a different uh, position uh, and you know, I just want to ensure that uh, whatever decisions are made are, are made uh, fairly and properly, recognising that we have a different position. So you could see a reverse, couldn't you, this time, that we are unfairly restricted, if you like, because London is still going to be more restricted or parts of the South are going to be more restricted. We just have to have a, you know, an engagement with the government about what is the fair way to do this, recognising that that the high numbers of cases still in many parts of the country and the pressure that, that hospitals uh, are are under. Just to say something further about the re regional variation in hospital mission, our system is under extreme pressure, as I've said earlier, but I think we are still able to provide a small amount of mutual aid to, to other, other regions that are in a, a slightly more uh, unmanageable uh, position. So, you know, yes, I have all of the concerns that I've always voiced uh, throughout this, this pandemic. I have real concerns about a return to the previous tier system, which quite honestly, I feel simply did not work to create a situation where you have shops and hospitality open in one part of the northwest and you don't in another 
just creates an incentive for people to travel uh, in my mind. And I think that explains some of what we saw in Liverpool uh, with the case rate running in and through the Christmas, the Christmas period. So I think there has to be another engagement with everybody about what is the right arrangement coming out of national lockdown. It can't be imposed uh, on the regions. They need to discuss this with us. Um, we've got obviously time to discuss the issue with schools. We now need a similar debate about where we're going when the, um, the, the national measures are released. Thanks, Andy. Um, given we've got a bit of time, we'll go back to Stephen Kingston at the Salford Star. Um, he's asked um, a question about the likelihood of the GM mayor election going ahead, and is it going ahead? I don't know. Uh, in some ways, you may know more than me, uh, Stephen. All, all, I will, all I can say is um, we were canvassed for our opinion uh, about uh, the timing of the, the May elections, not just the mayoral election, the local elections as well, um, a few weeks ago uh, by uh, by civil servants in the, in the uh, Ministry of uh, Housing, Communities and Local Government. I think the consensus here at the time was it would be safer to go towards the later part of the summer or indeed into September and I've seen a survey from the local government association, which uh, would suggest, I don't think this is of politicians, by the way, and I think it's sometimes better to get the view first of the people who would have to run the elections as opposed to the people who would have to stand in the elections because they may have a, a political vested interest in giving you a certain answer. The people who would be asked to run the elections safely are absolutely saying they think it would be safer to go a little later, although it's gone extremely quiet on the government front. and. In political circles, I think there's a growing expectation that it's looking like uh, the May elections will go ahead. So it's a it's a confusing position, if I'm honest with you. Um, and I do think it needs uh, needs clearing up. I think it was around this time last year where this issue first first emerged. So you know, this would feel the time, I think, to, to, to clear this uh, clear this issue up. The key has got to be not a political consideration, the safety consideration. That's got to be the driving consideration here. Is it safe to have an election campaign? Is it safe to ask everybody to go out of their homes and go to the polls? And you know, did local government have the resources to make the polling stations COVID secure? Those are the considerations. And I think the, the sort of silence around it and secrecy around it in some ways suggests that the political considerations are maybe over overriding the safety considerations and that genuinely cannot possibly be right. Thanks Andy and given we do have a bit of time we'll go back to Jen Williams as well um, for the final question which is do you have any idea what plans Manchester Airport has for quarantining travellers including any hotel provision that's being drawn up? Uh, I'll be honest, uh, Jen, I don't. Uh, I do meet with the airport regularly and I met uh, just over a week ago with them, uh, but I, you know, we, we weren't aware of the government's plan at that particular uh, point. So uh, I would have to um, ask again Ross or the team to, to come back to you with a, with a more detailed uh, reply about that. I do know that um, the airport um, are worried about um, the, the way in which 2021 is not unfolding in the way that they were hoping. Um, we are working with them to call on the government for a clear roadmap for uh, services uh, to return. Um, and, you know, that absence of that continues to make the operating climate incredibly difficult for Manchester Airport. On the quarantining issue, uh, obviously, it does imply that there would have to be use of uh, local uh, hotel capacity. I wouldn't want to give you an answer without having uh, consulted the airport. So if we could do that and come back to you, uh, we, we will do that later today. That's us out of questions. So if you get any final thoughts. Well, I'll um, go to Bev no. first. Bev, is there anything you would like to say before we uh, before we wrap up? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, so, so so am I. Uh, so thank you everybody for uh, for attending uh, today. Um, the summary is that Greater Manchester continues um, in some ways to make good progress on reducing cases, strong showing on vaccination, but uh, the National Health Service is under pressure uh, to an extent that we've probably never seen before in living memory. And um, again, I come back to it, that persistent, significant um, recalcitrant minority of people uh, are continuing to put unacceptable pressure on Greater Manchester Police, but particularly 
on the front line of our national health service and the truth of the matter is there are more younger people in in hospital now than there were in the first wave the the age related heat maps which i showed you prove that there is still way too much mixing going on amongst the younger the younger age groups um this is this is um a critical moment and they need to to listen uh, to the messages they need to recognize that the the second uh, because if you look at the figures of the, the hundred thousand that have died we have seen obviously half of those deaths in just the last uh, few weeks and that should bring over to people the danger of the situation that we are in and the danger to everybody and i just hope uh, and ask people uh, to, to to listen to the messages we are far from out of the most danger. We are we're probably in the most dangerous moment of this pandemic, the most difficult moment. Please ask, do what you're being asked to do. Respect the NHS. Ross, I'll leave it there. Thank you for taking us through the questions. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We will see you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.